Today, we're going to discuss one of the most sensitive and serious topic in the Bible. The unpardonable sin or the sin of the Holy Spirit. So the question is, what are the sins against the Holy Spirit? Why it is called unpardonable sin? Many have asked, what is unpardonable sin? Simply means, any sin that you have not repented and asked forgiveness, that is considered as unpardonable. Whether big sin or small sin. So this topic is not a matter of knowing biblical facts, but it determines one's destiny. To understand what constitutes the sin against Holy Spirit or the unpardonable sin, we need to know what are the precise works of the Spirit in the life of Christians. Apostle John warned, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that you should pray about that. 1 John 5, 16. So we understand that the Bible says there is a sin that led to death. Okay? So we need to understand also that every sin is uh, the penalty is death. So there is also a sin which does not lead to death. But unless this sin is confessed, repented of, and as, as been forgiven, constitute the unpardonable sin. First, we will study distinctive works of the Holy Spirit. In the lives of a person who follow the Lord according to the word of God. Second, we will study the different sins committed against the Holy Spirit being considered as unpardonable. In what ways and events or circumstances this occurred? And who were the people or example of people mark that incurred unpardonable sin because the Bible give us that? This is important to to clear the understanding of the sin and be aware of its severe warnings and consequences. Now let's look at, let's talk about the spiritual birth from on high. The person who believed in God through Jesus Christ entered into the community of faith. Do and follow rituals of religious services like Nicodemus who never short of fulfilling the requirement of religion, but it was not enough. The requirement for all who believe in Jesus is to experience be born from on high or a spiritual rebirth. Jesus answered, Most I surely I say to you, unless one born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The word again is in Greek is anotin. It is not palin, which means to repeat. Anotin means from on high. So that's why the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of spirit. John 3, 5 to 8. So it is clear, the experience of a spiritual birth is the work of the Holy Spirit. Unless one has undergone this process, Jesus asserts, that believer cannot enter the kingdom of God, even though he is doing the requirements of a good Christian as expected. Okay? 
This is what Jesus says. Unless you are born of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so, let's see. The utmost requirement of a spiritual birth. In the case of Nicodemus and other religious, performance are outward. But being born from on high is inward power of the Holy Spirit that's supposed to empower and sanctify those outward acts. Notice the word again in English. It's a wrong translation from Greek. The word again, as I said, means to repeat, to do it again, afresh. The Greek word is anoten, which means from above. From heaven really means born from on high as a spiritual rebirth done by the Holy Spirit. The, the, since the Spirit is from above or heaven, it is supernatural spiritual birth. The person must undergo in this divine requirement unless delivery experience is born from above. No entrance to God's kingdom that is the conclusion of Jesus. Remember Nicodemus was already a member of community of faith. He has been already baptized. It cannot refer to water baptism. Because there are two baptisms in the Bible. That's clear. And many of us were just put in a lump sum this too. Look, John the Baptist the followers of the Messiah must undergo two baptisms in the New Testament time. John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I, coming whose sandal and strap I am not worthy to lose, will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. Luke 3.16 after the baptism of water, water baptism, it would be followed by baptism of Holy Spirit and fire according to John, the Baptist. This is clear. Again, indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me mightier than me is the whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire, Matthew 3.11. So when it is repeated, you need to listen because that is an emphasis. So a person who believes the truth and accepts Christ as his or her Lord and Savior is baptized first with baptism of repentance as an entrance to the church. Water baptism is a symbol of death of Christ. It cannot be from on high. Because it's law. Listen what Paul says. Do you know that many of us were baptized into Christ? Were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so even so, we should walk in the newness of life. Romans 6, 3 and 4. So our baptism is a law baptism, not from on high. It's not a spiritual. Our baptism is an entrance to the church. Entering into the community of faith of Jesus Christ. So, do not mistake that. Water baptism, then baptism of the Holy Spirit. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now, according to Acts. Baptism or giving the Holy Spirit is not one event, but separate. The problem with many of us, including me, before that, when a person is baptized, we understand that he received the Holy Spirit. But look at this, these are two separate events. The Holy Spirit is not given a full measure like the Pentecost because the context, we look at the Pentecost that the Holy Spirit is poured down. Today, we have a measure of the Holy Spirit. That's what I know. From the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Look, when Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Father for remission of your sin. 
And then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. After, not the same event. We need to, to be careful how do we read. How do we read our scripture? And so they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak. And the Spirit gave them a terence, Acts 2.4. That is now the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many were baptized? And we said, Lord, okay, forgive them, read their name, give their, the Holy Spirit. How many of them? I baptized already a number of people. But the giving of the Holy Spirit is a separate. There are conditions. So this is the problem of assumption. The problem is that many interpret of Jesus' statement, born of water and spirit, to mean a person's baptism, baptism is not born from on high. It is a burial of sin in the watery grave. A public testimony that one will follow, identified with Christ, as many as who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, buried. So that is in Romans. It is not the same event as the giving of the Holy Spirit unless it was in Pentecost. So there is a connection of Christian baptism, but that is not the meaning of born again or born from on high. This is clear to Paul when he went into Ephesus. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And he said, we do not know. We do not know that there is Holy Spirit. He asked, into what baptism you are baptized? He said, we received the baptism of John. And Paul says, ah, you were baptized, the baptism of repentance. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And then Paul baptized them. And the Holy Spirit came. See? This is after Paul. During Paul, I mean. So, how many years since the ascension of Jesus? We have to understand context. So we have a problem of sin of presumption. Many committed the sins of presumption. Presumption is the idea that is taken to be true on the basis of probability. It is an act of believing that something is true without having any proof. In other words, self-assurance. It is something taken as being true or factual and used as a starting point of a course of action or reasoning of self-confidence. This kind of sin is serious in the Bible. In fact, the, the psalmist says, Keep back your servant from the sin, presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless when I'll be innocent of the great transgression. Psalms 19.13 so, no man who acts presumptuously, he will not heed to the priest who stand the minister. Therefore, the Lord your God or judge, man shall die. So, you shall put away that evil. So, if we think there is a presumption the way we do, I think we need to repent. It's not the basis. Okay? So, it is a deadly sin. Okay? But a person who does anything presumptuously, whether native born or stranger, one brings reproach to the Lord, he shall be cut off among the people. And we find that presumption is a dangerous sin. So let's look at now the Holy Spirit. Because all things, all the teachings of God comes from above, having born from above, they can now understand spiritual things and obey God's word. So the Holy Spirit will teach spiritual things to the Christians who have spiritual rebirth. I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. How would you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus says that. Because Cornelio was not yet born from on high. And Jesus asserts, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray to the Father that he will give you another help that will abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit is 
omnipresent. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in you and he will be in you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. What's the work of the Holy Spirit? He will teach all things. That's why I argue through the scripture. Those who believe that spirit is a fire, a wind, a power, an influence in a force, that's very questionable. And he brings you all things to remembrance. John 14, 15, 16, and 26. Who is the ultimate teacher of God's truth, according to Jesus? is the Holy Spirit. What happened to a person who maligned the Holy Spirit? He has no teacher anymore. As Christians obey and follow God's teaching, they will live quality of life before God. No longer the life before their conversion. Therefore, brethren, we are the debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as lead by the Spirit of God, these are the children or the sons of God. This is very clear. When the Holy Spirit lead us, we are considered as sons of God. But when there is no Holy Spirit leading, we live a life of the flesh, we will die. Because the Spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8, 12 to 16. Natural, carnal, or worldly life is contrary to the Spirit-led life. They cannot coexist. One must be above master of life. Only those born from on high will walk and live by the Spirit. If you are worldly, likely, you are not walking with the Holy Spirit. You have not been born again. But likely, you are a candidate to be burned again. The Holy Spirit can testify before God by living a spiritual life. They are now adopted as the children of God since they lead and live by the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, you are led by the Spirit, you walk by the life of the Spirit because the life of a flesh is against the Spirit. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not know the things that you wish. But if you lead by the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. And those who are in Christ crucify the place with passion and desires. So if we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. You can only walk with the Spirit when the Holy Spirit takes over your own life. You need to do a lot of surrendering before God. So that we can, you can walk. Christian life is empowered by the Holy Spirit not to do the fruit of the carnal wish and passion and desire. For the Holy Spirit will crucify or control them. The Spirit empowers to overcome and control them since they are walking and led by the Holy Spirit. All this shows that the Holy Spirit is making genuine Christians. By empowering and transforming them into the likeness of Jesus' character. Look at this. Christian who live by carnal desire, passions, worldliness, is dead to spirituality. For worldliness or carnally minded is death. But spiritually minded is life and peace. Because worldliness, carnal mind, is an enmity against God, meaning continuous hostility against God. You'll never be in harmony with God, for it is not subject to the law, for indeed, so those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Likewise, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. 
Because we do not know what we should pray and ought, but the Spirit Himself make an intercession for us, groaning. Just imagine we do not know how to pray. It is the Holy Spirit who teaches us, and our prayer recorrect that before it reaches the Father. I call this the Holy Spirit is editing our prayer because we do not know what to pray. That's what Paul is saying. Because, verse 27, now he who searches the hearts know what is in the mind of spirit because he make intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit make an intercession so that our connection with God will be right. So the Holy Spirit help us in our weakness, correct our prayers, make intercession to God according to God's will. These are the works of the Holy Spirit in behalf of the believers. So let us not malign the Holy Spirit. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 and 22, that God promised us, He established with us, he sealed us His Spirit. He put the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee so that so in salvation, the fullness of it, because there is a guarantee, then is the security of our own salvation. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit. Guarantee of inheritance. Paul repeated that in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Unless we have the seal of the Holy Spirit, we cannot go to the kingdom of God. So the sealing of the Spirit is a deposit that testifies and confirms the authenticity of the genuineness of the Christian that they are the property of God. That's clear. Nevertheless, the solid foundation stands having the seal. The Lord knows who are His, and let everyone who name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2.19 When we are doing iniquity, that's questionable. The seal of God is not there. The seal of God, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee, is not really a guarantee. So, God the Father anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. That's Act 38. So, the Christian received anointing from the Spirit. Listen to John, 1 John 2, 20, 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. You do not need anyone to teach you, but the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and true is not lie, as just it has taught you, you will abide in him. Just imagine that. During the time when they were taught, they accept the Holy Spirit. They don't need a teacher. What they need because the Holy Spirit teaching them all things to be righteous, to live a holy life. So the anointing is the operation of the Holy Spirit within man. When the nerves and the brain direct and coordinate all the members of the body, the head communicates and directs all the members through nerves and through nerves to all members that are related to one another as well. All the members in the body move according to the direction of the nerve. Submitting the nerves is submitting to the head. So the Holy Spirit teachings by anointing. He is teaching all the truth. We do not know the will of God by studying and weighing the pros and cons of particular matter. We know the will of God by the teaching of the anointing of the Holy Spirit for He knows all things of God. So the Holy, Holy Spirit communicates to the mind of Christ to us. That's why, Paul, we have the mind of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.16 The mind developed, bear fruits. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, according to Galatians 5.22-23. So the Christian must pray to the Holy Spirit. Many people derail, malign the Holy Spirit. But look at Jude is saying, Beloved, building yourself up, your holy faith, faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourself in love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. This verse, give me the foundation 
that although Jesus, the model of prayer that we need in his name to the Father, but now we find that we need to pray to the Holy Spirit. Beloved, building yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So we can pray to the Holy Spirit because he is God. He's not a wind. He is not a fire, power, or influence. He is a person interceding. Don't you know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, is holy the temple which you are. What? God will destroy. Do you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Temple of God and the temple of Holy Spirit. Parallel. Therefore, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, do in the glory of God. So the question, how do we treat the holy temple of the Holy Spirit? With our lips or mouth or ears, our eyes, our brain, our body. His temple is holy. We are constantly aware of that fact. How do we view matters of holiness that could bring glory to God? The Holy Spirit is responsible for transforming sinful nature into divine nature. Unless this carnal, worldly flesh is alive, the old man dies. According to Ephesians, we cannot have the assurance of heaven. Apostle Peter declared that God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that his divine power has given us all things that pertain and godliness. The true knowledge of him who called us by his glory, by the virtue that has been given to us exceedingly precious promises through partakers of divine nature. Having escaped the corruption in the word of lust. So until this corrupt nature, this sinful nature, this old self is not transformed or replaced into the divine nature, we are hopeless to overcome sin. So, according to Ellen White, Rebian Herald, April 24, 1906, you must realize that through belief in him, our privilege to be partaker of divine nature, escape from corruption that is in the word of lust. These are cleansed from sin, all defects of character. We need not to retain one simple propensity. As we partake divine nature, hereditary cultivated tendencies to wrong are cut away from character. We are made a living power for good. Every learning of divine teacher daily partaking his divine nature to cooperate with God, overcoming Satan's temptation. God works, man works, and man may be one with Christ as Christ is one with God. So long as we depend we rationalize that we cannot stop sinning. Our carnal, sinful nature is powerful and the divine nature cannot work its power. Hence, the person chose to remain sinning. We need to, lay to obey Jesus. When we love the Lord Jesus Christ, we must listen and obey what he says. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be given to you. For without me, you can do nothing. Jesus promises his followers, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you. We are powerless to do anything like the apostle until clothed with the power on high. We need to pray and ask this power daily. Jesus says, how much your heavenly father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The biggest problem is that God's people are reluctant to us. Others malign, negate the Holy Spirit works in their lives. The Holy Spirit is our utmost need. Jesus' work on earth was powerful because all his life and ministry is with the power of the Holy Spirit, according to Luke 4, 16. And the power of the Spirit and holiness, according to Romans 1, 4. So the Holy Spirit makes genuine Christian, but he is responsible for convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, and of sin. So Jesus, concerning the Holy Spirit, he said, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, judgment. He's empowering people to confess and repent their sin 
help them change life into holiness and godliness. So the absence of the Holy Spirit makes the gospel ministry, according to Ellen White, powerless. Christ of Lesson 328. So they are confusing description of the Holy Spirit. In many similar, but very also different ways like the Father. Sometimes the Bible uses word or phrases that seems the Holy Spirit is not a person. Some of these languages include word, pictures, or symbol, such as power, energy, influence, water, wind, and fire. This is confusing to many. Others take it to do something different. As a result, some people conclude that the Holy Spirit is not a real person at all. Instead, they view him as divine force and power. They think he is more like electric current that flows into us and gives us strength. It is easy enough to find verses that seems prove this view. This is a part of mystery of revelation of God concerning the Holy Spirit. So there are a lot of appellative names of the Holy Spirit. The third person of the garden has appellative names described, descriptive names. He is called the Spirit of God. The most popular is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord or just Spirit or the Spirit of Truth. But we need to understand that he is omniscience because he will guide you all the truth and all things. He speak also that the Holy Spirit is omniscience, God, because he feel each one individually as he wills. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Confirms the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. To sum it up, he has a personality like the Father and Son. But there is a shrouded mystery. The Holy Spirit is shrouded with mystery like the Father and Son, for he does not receive special attention. Center of attention, an attention that the biblical accord to the Father and Son. But the, but the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit was present in all human events in the sacred history. For example, God created the world and the Holy Spirit was at work during creation. Genesis 1-2. He worked behind the scenes, Psalm 104, 24 to 30. Even in the creation of man, Psalm 136, verses 1 to 7. This means he was more in the background, was also involved the work of inspiring or communicating God's message prophet, his special messenger. In this way, the Holy Spirit had significant role in writing God's word, the Bible, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 2.21, the production of the Bible. So, why many did not understand? And this is a reason that the Holy Spirit are blasphemed. Because the Holy Spirit does not come on the center stage. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit chooses to be behind the scene helper. He supports, he helps, he provides, he teaches, he guides whatever is needed in the church, the body of Christ. He works this way and all he does now and has done. He does not try to get honor or fame. But the Holy Spirit is not the center of the Bible. We know little about him. He remains in that background. His work and purpose are to help the work of the Godhead. The work of the Holy Spirit is to give glory to God the Father and Jesus according to John 16, 13, and 14. In fact, Fall a search, triple blessing of God. The grace of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the love and the communion of the Holy Spirit with you all. So he is on the background. That's why his activities is not like Jesus and God the Father. And so there was something that people cannot perceive it. The study of who is the Holy Spirit demands a heart that is both teachable and meek not to be proud with asserting our own personal ideas, concept, logic, reasoning, philosophy, in understanding the Holy Spirit, contrary to what is revealed in the Bible. We should not make our own ideas about the standard or role, how the Holy Spirit should be understood. Instead, we should accept as truth what the Bible teaches by faith. Some of this teaching may be hard for us to understand fully, but we must accept the truth by faith above our own unsanctified, 
unholy reasons, opinion and guesses, theological construct unfounded in God's word. For we cannot understand the Holy Spirit without God's revelation. Otherwise, we destroy ourselves. Men cannot explain except what is revelation. This is according to Ellen White. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Just imagine, it's revelation. Men have fanciful view. We bring together passages of scripture, but human construction of them, but acceptance to this view will not strengthen the church regarding the mystery, which are too deep for human understanding. Silence is goodness, is golden. When you cannot understand about the Holy Spirit, you keep quiet rather than prating. Rather than making others, you are have the tendency to commit unpardonable sin, as we, we look at later on. According to the Acts Petito, Acts of the Apostle, Ellen White says in pages 52, she says, The Holy Spirit withdraw affection from the things of this earth. Our affection, when we are guided by the Holy Spirit, our affection from these things of this world, he withdraw and fills the soul with desire of holiness. If men are willing to be molded, will be brought about sanctification of the whole being. God has been working in the instrumentality for the accomplishment of his purpose in behalf of the fallen race. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Be careful anything you say about the Holy Spirit. The Bible shows us the Father God is, who the God the Father is. It also shows us who that He is God. Both truth, who the Father is, and the truth that He is God are never doubted in the Bible. The Bible also clearly declared that Jesus to be God. It shows to be, it shows who He is. The New Testament especially declares this truth in the Gospels and the letters of Paul. The Bible also teaches that the Holy Spirit is God, but this truth is not clearly shown. Instead, the Bible hints at this truth in different texts. We need to compare verse by verse in order to study carefully what God has shown in His Word about the Holy Spirit. When doing so, we should not say something that is not true, that the Bible does not say it is true. We should not ignore what the Bible declares as truth. Because Jesus says, by your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. If we cannot understand about the Holy Spirit, we better keep quiet. Silence is golden, Ellen White's statement. Why? Because you are intruding into the holiness of God a person of God who will change us into the likeness of Christ's character. For the Pharisee said that Jesus cast out demons through the rulers of demons. Belzebub, Matthew 12, 25. Attributing the works of Jesus as the work of the devil. Extremely careful. Many of us have questions concerning the Holy Spirit. One should be extremely careful what words that come from our lips. When our words are negative or against the Holy Spirit, not bridle or censor for your limited, the result is clear. You are snared by your words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth, Proverbs 6, 2. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God it was an error. Why you should be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? Ecclesiastes 5, 6. This is the principle that Jesus says. For every idle word men speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. By your words you will be justified. By your words you will be condemned. Be careful. When our words is used against the Holy Spirit. We are speaking anything that belittles the Holy Spirit. In the day of judgment, we are condemned unless you repent. Unless we repent. Let's go to Mark. Matthew and Mark. 
attributing the work of God as the work of the devil is the sin against the Holy Spirit. To attribute the work of Jesus of healing the demon possessed and the blind and the mute in Matthew 12, 22, as the work of the devil constitute blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven by men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speak a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven. But whoever speak against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Matthew 12, 31. That is a very, very sensitive and serious statement of Jesus Christ. He can forgive anything what you do. You are not the Son of Man. But since the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches to guide about the truth, and you are hurting Him, He will get away from you. And you will not be forgiven. In this age. But men today... Instead of blaspheming by saying the Holy Spirit is not person, but wind, energy, power, influence, therefore, he is not God, host, what the Pharisee says. We have some equivalent. The Pharisee and the scribe says, he is the principal of the demons because he casts out demons. Meaning to say, the work of God is attributed to the work of the devil, constitute. Sinned against the Holy Spirit. How is that related when you say, oh, the Holy Spirit is, is not a person, it's a wind, it's an energy, it's a power, it's an influence. I think there's something wrong with those statements. That's why I said, we better keep quiet rather than prating. Remember that in the book of Isaiah 63, we read, I saw the Isaiah related to the Jew of unbelief the people of God reveal and grieve His Holy Spirit. As a result, He turned Himself against them as an enemy and fought them against them. When we don't, when we have the unbelief that about the Holy Spirit, we turn becomes an enemy, and the Holy Spirit will fight against us. If rebellion and grieving makes the enemy of the Holy Spirit much more with blasphemy. As surely, according to Mark 3.28, Jesus said, All sins will be forgiven. Whatever blasphemy me utter, but blaspheme the Holy Spirit, never has forgiveness, but subject to eternal condemnation, because they said he has unclean spirit. Just imagine that. So we need to be careful, my brothers and sisters, especially talking of the Holy Spirit. There is a limitation. There is a censure when especially it is negative. To Jesus, you can say anything but the Holy Spirit who changes us to become a better Christian. Here in Mark, it was the scribe who attributed the work of Jesus as the work, the ruler of demons. Three things were committed. Jesus is out of mind. That's what he said. Jesus becomes the ruler of demons. And Jesus has unclean spirit. This meaning that Jesus was totally possessed by the demon. is a blunt blasphemy. And people just speak. This is a serious topic. We are all weak sinners. But we can still fight against the Holy Spirit power. The Spirit does not force Himself on us. Sin is a very charming and appealing, but it is also very misleading that leads to death. This is because sin is completely opposed to God. Instead, God is pure, holy, and good. The Holy Spirit shows us God's goodness. The Holy Spirit is against sin in every form. He is grave when we sin. And do not want to give it up. The Holy Spirit is very powerful. But he says positive power influence can be ignored and put out in the same way that a fire can be put out with water. And we oppose the Holy Spirit's power 
we continue in our lives, sinful lives. The gospel tells us that there is only one sin that cannot be forgiven. And that sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit by refusal in spite of clear evidence. Okay? God works. As God works, the Holy Spirit works. He is omnipotent. He distributes his spiritual gift to each one individually as he wills. So he is an omnipotent God. He is omnipresent. He will abide with you forever. No one can escape his influence according to Psalm 139. His omniscience. This text sum it all. But God has revealed to them through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. He is the deep things of God. He understands everything about God about us and you say he's not God that would lead to unpardonable sin he is light Paul refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of life he is the truth Christ called him the spirit of truth John 16 13 this activity cannot be performed by a mere power influence or force or wind neither fire but attributes of God only only person can perform that He helps and intercede. Only can person do these things. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our weaknesses, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. Romans 8, 26-27. He inspired and moves. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, 21. He sanctifies. Election according to foreknowledge of the Father in sanctification of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 1, 2. And Job said, the Spirit of God has made me. This is creation. The breath of the mountain give me light. Job 33, 4. The psalmist says, you sent your spirit and they were created. Involving creation. Psalm 104, 30. Paul claimed, he, the God the Father, raised Jesus from the dead. Also give you mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. These are the works of God. We discussed already Matthew 12 and Mark 3, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Ellen White says, when our eyes close to evidence, like the Pharisee attributed to satanic agency, the holy power of God manifested in the works, thus the Pharisee sin against the Holy Ghost. Stubborn, sullen, iron-hearted, they determined to close their eyes on evidence, thus they committed unpardonable sin. It's clear. So, I said, be careful about the Holy Spirit. Since the Pharisee had the same theology, we describe both religious leaders committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So, what are the manifestations of sin against the Holy Spirit? One, resisting the Holy Spirit. You step naked and circumcised in hearts and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your father. You receive the law by the direction of angels, but you have not keep it. Acts 7, 51, 53. In spite of clear evidence, they resisted God in the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Not one, but many times. The result was resisting was persecution and killing. Lying to the Holy Spirit is equal to lying to God. But certain man by the name of Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold position and kept back of the proceed. His wife, being aware of it, and bought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why Satan filled your heart to lie the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. Did you see the equal parallel? Lying to the Holy Spirit is equal to lying to God. Did Ananias, hearing the sword, he fell down and he breathed his life. And Peter says, why do you taste the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband at the door and they will carry you out. That's direct. Unpardonable sin. Grieving the Holy Spirit. The list of behaviors that grieves the Holy Spirit Say, therefore, putting lying, let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor. 
for we are members of one another. Be angry, but that do not sin. Let, let that the sun go down your wrath. Give place no evil. Let him who stole steal no more, rather than let him labor, working with his hands. Let no corrupt proceed from your mouth. For what is good necessary edification that may impart to the hearers, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed. What? What can grieve the Holy Spirit? Lying, stealing, corrupt words. And then he continues, all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all mildness. Be kind to one another, tender handed. Forgiving one another, even as God forgiving you. Ephesians 4, 25, 32. This is grieving of the Holy Spirit. Anything that grieves the Holy Spirit and we have not asked forgiveness leads to unpardonable sins. These are steps in committing unpardonable sin. Next is quenching the Spirit. Things that quench the Spirit. Paul says, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for all, rejoice, always pray without ceasing. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not, do not despise prophecies. Think, taste all things. Hold past what is good. Abstain from every fo uh, form of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Rendering evil to evil is a bad attitude. It is a quenching the Holy Spirit, the fire. According to this text, context, four things may be quenched the Holy Spirit, lead to unpardonable sin if not repentance. Because any sin, however small, if not repented, becomes unpardonable because the person failed to ask forgiveness and repentance. These are steps. Backsliding, insulting. For it is impossible for those who once enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, backslide, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again the Son of God and put him on an open shame. My brothers and sisters, careful, backsliding, insulting, putting into open shame. How, how much more worse punishment do you suppose will be who thought worthy and trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, insulting the Spirit of grace. Hebrews 10.29 Insulting, backsliding, leads to unpardonable sin. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but to those who believe, the saving of the soul. Hebrews 10, Another manifestation, continuous willful sinning is a trampling, insulting the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the series. We can stop sinning, how to stop sin, and the third, how to stop sin of presumption and omission. Because continuous willful sinning it's an insult to the Holy Spirit because you are called to a life of holiness. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses us. If we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of truth, no longer remain sacrifice of sin, but for certain prayerful expectation of judgment and fear and indignation, which will devour the adversary. How much more worse punishment do you suppose? Those who trample, because that is insulting the Holy Spirit. It's a long passage. Willfully sin, insulting the Holy Spirit. Rebellion and grieving. This is an Old Testament. We understand. They rebelled and grieved the Holy Spirit and God fight against them. They become an enemy. We have to understand. We must obey the Holy Spirit because He will sanctify us Make us holy, make us a Christian day by day. But speaking against him, that he is, a, he is only a fire, he is only a wind. Listen to what Ellen White says. 
the most common manifestation of sin against the Holy Spirit is persistently slighting heaven's invitation to repent. Get that? Common manifestation of sin against the Holy Spirit does not listen to what God says. The invitation to repent. Every sin we commit, we must repent. Every step in the rejection of Christ is a step towards rejection of salvation, towards the sin against the Holy Spirit. In, reject in rejecting Christ, the Jewish people committed unpardonable sin. By refusing the invitation of mercy, we may commit the same error. We offer insult to the Prince of Life, put him to shame before the synagogue of Satan, before the heavenly universe, when we refuse to listen to his delegated messengers. Instead of listening to the agents of Satan, who would draw your soul away from Christ. So long as one does this, he cannot find hope or pardon. He will finally lose all desire to be reconciled with God. Desire of Ages 324. What a statement. We need to be careful. If we don't repent, because today sin looks not as if it is a sin. It's a lapse. It's a failure. But to God, anything against God and against others is sin. So, this is again Ellen White saying. Christ told them plainly, attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. That's why I said, yeah. That's why I heard some people, ah, this is the work of the devil. When I have my baptism, so this is the work of the devil. I just keep quiet. He who rejects the work of the Holy Spirit is placing himself where repentance and faith cannot come to him. It is by the Spirit that God works upon the heart. When men willfully rejected the Spirit and declared it from Satan, they cut up the channel by which God's communicate to them. When the Spirit is finally rejected, there is no more than God can do for the soul. Cut off. Be careful. Again, she said in testimonies to ministers, 393-94, if men would only give the spirit of resistance to the Holy Spirit, the spirit which has been long living the religious experience, God's spirit would address itself to the heart. It would convict of sin. What a work. But the Holy Spirit has been insulted and light has been rejected. Will the voice of the Spirit of God distinguish from the deceiving voice of the enemy? There are men who will soon evidence which banner they standing under. The banner of the prince of life or the banner of the prince of darkness. If they could only see matters as they are presented to me, if they could see as far as their soul are concerned, there are men standing on the brink of precipice ready to slide over the depths below. Because insulting, rejecting. What's your word? Closely connected with the warning against the regards of sin against Holy Spirit is warning against idle words or evil words. Words are indication that which is in the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But the words are more than indication of character. They have a power to react the character. Men are influenced by their words. Open under momentarily impulse prompted by Satan, they give utterance to jealousy or evil surmising, expressing that which they do not really believe. But the expression reacts to the thoughts, and they are deceived by their words, and come to believe the truth which spoken at Satan's instigation. Having once expressed opinion or decision, they are often too proud to retract. They try to prove themselves in the right until they be believe that they are. This is dangerous. Because the more you feed your body that the Holy Spirit is fire, influence, force, you are moving away on the protection of God. You move towards the direction of the other, of the enemy of God. Doubt is dangerous. It is dangerous to utter a doubt. 
dangerous to question, criticize divine light. The habit of carelessness, irreverent criticism, reacts the character. It fostering irreverence and unbelief. Many a man indulging this habit has gone unconscious danger until he was ready to criticize, reject the work of the Holy Spirit. Every idle word, men will speak, they will give an account on the day of judgment. Much more with the Holy Spirit. By the words, you shall be justified. By the work, you shall be condemned. What idle words? Idle word is the Holy Spirit is influence, power, energy, force, and wind. Break, not a person. The Holy Spirit forsake that person because he is hurt. But all who submit themselves to the Holy Spirit, a new principle of life is to be implanted. The lost image of God will be restored in humanity. Christ of Revelation, page 26. Let's look at now in the Old Testament. Who are people who committed sin against the Holy Spirit? Sad to say, it is the priest, the pastors in the Old Testament. According to Ellen White, the sin of Nadab and Abihu, the priest next to highest ranks of the leadership of Moses and Aaron, lost discretion between profane and holy. They were working directly opposed, hindered to God's Holy Spirit. This included all the sympathizers committed fatal sin, according to Pachek and Prophets 363-61. The Spirit of God is ever seeking to break the spell of infantuation that hold men absorbed of worldly things and awaken to desire imperishable treasure. By resisting the Spirit, that men become inattentive or neglect of God's word. Careful. The priest Supposed to be, it comes from the lips of the priest comes the knowledge of God. But look at this priest. It's a lesson. Nathan and Abiram, the 14,000 uh, companions, Korah questioned, murmured, rebelled leadership of Moses. And according to them, cause of that good God lament, this act sealed their doom. They had committed sin against the Holy Spirit, a sin by which man's heart effectually hardened against the influence of divine grace. Pachak and Prophets 4 or 5. It is through the agency of the Holy Spirit that God communicates with man. And those who deliberately reject the agency as satanic, have cut off the channels of communication between soul and heaven. The transgressor has cut himself off from God, and sin has no remedy to cure itself. Pachak and Prophets, the same page, 405. Refusing, slighting, rejecting, rejecting, this is what happened. Let's look at the Sarah Vigis 324. So if we will not repent, the Holy Spirit of God, a knowledge of the Word of God is no avail. Theory of truth, not. And accompanied by the Holy Spirit cannot weaken the soul or sanctify the heart. Without enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish between truth and error. They will fall under the masterful of temptation of Satan. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit does not happen because just one word or act. I said there are steps. The sin against the Holy Spirit is, is steady. Ongoing choice over time to turn away from truth and the fruit of it. Further, the sin of the Holy Spirit is not something that cannot be understood or explained. The sin of the Holy Spirit is the sin of refusing to answer Time after time, the invitation to repent is what Ellen White says in her comment in his day commentary, volume 5, 1093. Every true believer should listen to the small voice and obey. Your ears hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand, whenever you turn to the left. Isaiah 30, 21. So the sin against the Holy Spirit. Let us look at those people. Balaam. He was a prophet. But he changed the secret word, the secret work of God that he was entrusted to him. 
with the treasures of Balak. Listen. Disappointed in his hope of the wealth and promotion, in this fever of the king, unconscious that he had incurred displeasure of God, Balaam returned from his self-chosen mission. After he reached his home, the controlling power of the Holy Spirit left him. His covetousness, which had merely sick, prevailed. Balaam and Judas received the great light, enjoyed special privilege, but a single cherish sin poisoned the entire character and caused their destruction. They committed unpardonable sin. For a time, a person who committed this sin may appear to be children of God. It will be found that they are on the enemy's ground, standing under the black banner. Testimonies, Volume 5, uh, 634. Let's look at Felix and Rosella. Look at from Ellen White. Felix and Rosella, they know God's way. But here, he slighted. The last offer of mercy, never was he to receive another call from God. And pardonable sin. Pistos and Agrippa and Bernice might justice have worn fitters of Paul. They were all guilty of grievous crimes. The offenders on the day heard the salvation through the name of grace. One at least had been almost persuaded to accept the grace and pardon offer, but Agrippa put aside the proffered mercy, refusing to accept the cross, a crucified reniever. Never again. The Holy Spirit moved them. They committed unpardonable sin. Pero, pero hardening heart against the influence of the Holy Spirit of all the miracles that have done. They should neglect and resist them to the truth, such is the harvest which they reap. Mercy might interpose and give them opportunity to accept, but after light has been long rejected, despite it was finally withdrawn, committed unpardonable sin. I want to summarize and make a conclusion. No one need to look upon sin against Holy Spirit as something mysterious and indefinable. The sin against the Holy Spirit is the sins of persistent refusal to respond the invitation to repent. Rebian Herald, June 29, 87. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit does not lie sudden in a word or deed. It is a firm, determined resistance of truth and evidence. Manuscript 30, March 1890, paragraph 16. What constitute against the Holy Ghost? It is willfully attributing to work that the work of the Spirit. The stimulus to the church, volume 5, 634. God gives sufficient evidence, candid mind to believe, but he who turns from weight of evidence because there are few things which he cannot make plain to his finite understanding, will live in the cold, chilling atmosphere of unbelief, and questioning doubts will make him sick, sick of faith. Satan has ability to suggest doubts and to devise objection, as pointed to the statement of God, since many think a virtue mark of intelligence in them, to unbelieving and to a question quibble. Those who desire doubt have plenty of room. God does not propose to remove all location for unbelief. He gives evidence and must be carefully investigated with a humble mind and teachable spirit. All should decide from the way of evidence. My brothers and sisters, I have discussed what is the sin of the Holy Spirit. It is not immediate. It is gradual. Refusing to repent. Refusing to believe. Is lighting the invitation to repent, to accept the truth, to work in the truth. The sin of the Holy Spirit is really serious in the Bible. We need to understand the works of the Holy Spirit is holy, making us holy, sanctified, change our character with our own cooperation and consent so that we will be prepared for the coming of the Lord. But is lighting, rejecting, 
maligning, ignoring. These are the manifestation that later on a person commits unpardonable sin and he lost his eternal life. May what we have discussed and presented, open your minds, ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom. That you will understand spiritual things because it is only Him, the Holy Spirit, can open our minds to understand deep and spiritual things like the Bible because the Bible is the spiritual mind of God. May the Lord bless us that we may continue to be humble, not speaking words if we cannot understand what the works of the or the person of the Holy Spirit will become closer. May the love of God continue to impress you and the Holy Spirit, His influence by calling us into a way of life of holiness will prepare us for His kingdom. This is my prayer.